evening. I'm Mark Syme, the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ, and uh, you have tuned in to the evening services, the PM services, uh, for Sunday, uh, April the 18th. Uh, per usual, we will sing a few songs for our encouragement and for the praise of the Lord. We will observe the Lord's Supper, and I will deliver a short message that I hope will be uh, insightful uh, to all of you and be worthwhile. So if you would please, from Songs of Faith and Praise, if you would turn your songbooks to number 185, 185. <clears throat> Jesus, thy name I love, all other names above. Jesus, my Lord, hold thou heart all to me, nothing to Please, I see nothing apart from thee, Jesus, my Lord, thou blessed Son of God. my Lord, how mighty is thy love, all other loves above, love that I daily prove. Jesus, you're the sweetest name of all. Jesus, you always hear me when I call. Oh, Jesus, you pick me up each time I fall. You're the sweetest, the sweetest name of all. Jesus, how I love to praise your name. Jesus, you're still the first, the last, the same. Oh, Jesus, you died and took away my shame. You're the sweetest, the sweetest name of all. Jesus, you're the soon and coming King. Jesus, we need the love that you can bring. Oh, Jesus, 
We lift our voices up and sing your the sweetest, the sweetest name of all. You're the sweetest, the sweetest name of all. 77. Seventy-seven. <clears throat> Father, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. We love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. name and all the earth. Spirit, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the It's time to uh, gather about the Lord's table. And so if on this Sunday evening uh, you have not uh, had the opportunity to gather about the Lord's table and you have those emblems uh, handy uh, with you, um, uh, let's do that indeed. We know that uh, on the first day of the week, we are told that uh, the disciples gathered together and broke bread. And you know, we have the, the wonderful um, uh, prediction and prophecy of Jesus in the 53rd uh, chapter of Isaiah. Uh, it's uh, subtitled, The Suffering Servant. And it says, Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, nor did he open his mouth. 
These words were spoken some six or seven hundred years before the birth of Christ, and obviously they are describing Jesus, they are describing his death, and that uh, uh, he bore our iniquities. Uh, that is exactly what happened. That is exactly what Jesus did when he went to the cross. That is why every week we gather about uh, what we call the Lord's table, and we commune with God, and we uh, try our very, very best to remember the crucified Savior, the one that died for our sins, the one that gave up his body, the one that shed his blood, that our sins might be forgiven, and the church might be established, and that we might one day live with him forever. So as we gather about the table, let's do it with all seriousness. Let's make sure that uh, this is something that we are proud to do, that we're proud uh, that our uh, Savior gave his life up for each one of us. Let's pray for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that Jesus gave up his body uh, as the perfect sacrifice for us. We are in awe of that sacrifice. We're in awe of what you gave up, allowing your son to come to earth. And we are in awe of what Jesus did on the cross. Help us to hearken back to Calvary. Help it to make us fresh in our life and understand that Jesus gave up his life for us. As we partake of this bread, let's think of it as the body that he gave up for us. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. When the children of Israel were carrying out sacrifices, uh, the sacrifices of bulls and rams, the sacrifice of lambs. Uh, the biggest part of that sacrifice is the fact that these animals had to shed their blood. Uh, that was a part of the sacrifice. And Jesus' one-time sacrifice for us made all of that moot. He made all of that sacrifice uh, uh, pale in comparison to the fact that he shed his blood that we might have our sins forgiven. Let's pray for the cup. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that uh, Jesus was willing to be the perfect sacrifice. We're grateful that he was willing to shed his blood. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would uh, be with us, that you would uh, take care of us, and that you would help us to hearken back to what went on at Calvary, the blood that was shed to wash away our sins. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. And on the first day of the week, we are told to lay by in store, to give uh, that which we have been prospered. And I pray that you have given thought to this also during the week. Because when we return money to the Lord for the work of the church, we are just giving back God his own money. Uh, all that we have uh, comes from our perfect God in heaven. And we just pray that we will be generous, that we will give with the gratitude that we need to give with. Uh, let's pray together. We just thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for the privilege that we have of giving back to you. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, as we give uh, to realize that uh, Jesus gave the perfect gift of his life and all through the New Testament, uh, churches gave to one another. They gave in famine. They gave in times of need. Sometimes they gave when even they were in need. We pray that uh, we would give as we have purposed and we will always purpose each week to give uh, part of uh, what you have blessed us with back to you. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. 
And uh, the last song that we will sing is number 67. Six, seven. For the beauty of the earth, for the beauty of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies, Lord of all to Thee we raise this our sacrifice of praise for the beauty of each hour of the day and of the night hill and field and tree and flower sun and moon and stars of light lord of all our sacrifice of praise for the church that evermore lifted all the hands above offering upon every shore her pure sacrifice of love. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our sacrifice of praise. Wonderful job singing. I know that the Lord was praised and uh, uh, was lifted by our our praise of of him and i just pray that uh, uh, we sang with all of our heart uh, sometimes our voices betray us as we get older uh, they're not quite as good as they once were but uh, as uh, the lord views people uh, he views people differently than we view people and I believe that he listens to our songs of praise differently than people might uh, observe them. If you were uh, there uh, this morning, uh, you heard that uh, the lesson of the evening was uh, called to conform. And so we have this word conform. Uh, the term conformity comes from this term. The, form, the word nonconformity comes from this term. I know that uh, in my teaching career, uh, as it stretched out, I started teaching in the very late 60s and taught into the 2000s. But one of the lingering things that students always asked about in the 80s and the 90s and even in the 2000s uh, they read so much about the 60s. And so those of you who are out there that are 60 or 70 years old, I, I know that I'm teaching, uh, I'm preaching to a varied audience, so I know that uh, some of you did not live through the 60s, but they were a unique and interesting and turbulent time, and they might even be epitomized by saying, that people in, in this era, especially young people, were nonconformists. They did almost everything they could do to deviate from uh, normal expectations of them. Uh, interestingly enough, during the 60s, I went to 
uh, Christian colleges. I didn't go to Cal Berkeley. <laughs> I didn't go where they uh, took over the administration building. So I led somewhat of a sheltered life. So you know, perhaps my view of the 60s and, and some people's views were not exactly the same, but it was in the 60s that so many turbulent things happened. Uh, we had a president assassinated. We had his younger brother assassinated. Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated uh, all during uh, this era. And so many, many strange things happen. But uh, I say all this to say that it was an age of, I guess, what we might call nonconformity. And I'd like to challenge you to do something this evening. I would challenge you to take out your Bibles, and maybe not right now, but please mark them, and mark them to Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 15. I'd actually like you to read and to meditate upon these verses, and I'm going to encapsulate uh, some of that this evening in my message, and then I'll leave it up to you to see um, what I'm getting at when I talk about uh, this idea of being called to conform. Um, there is an attitude in our age today, and it's not certainly the 60s, that uh, people very often might say, you know what, you're going to have to take me as I am. Have you heard that before? You're just going to have to accept me just the way I am. This thing plays out on billboards. It plays out in movies. It plays out in songs. It plays out in commercials all around us. Basically, here's what it says. If you don't like me, that's your problem. If you don't like me, change your mind. Don't ask me to change mine. Don't ask me to change my lifestyle. If you want to get along with me, you need to conform to what I am. And you know what? I, to tell you the truth, I don't know exactly. I, you know, I, I'm not a social scientist. I don't know exactly how this plays out in person to person relationships. I know that kind of uh, uh, bells go off when people have that particular uh, attitude toward one another. But I'm getting at something else, All right? I'm talking about something deeper here. I'm not necessarily saying that you have to change if you want to get along with me and you have to take me the way I am. And here's where I'm going with this. Sometimes, sometimes this attitude carries over to the way we think about God. And we have the attitude that God accepts me for who I am. I don't have to change. He loves me regardless. Well, you know what? If we're living totally godly, holy, and righteous lives, uh, that might be true. But none of us falls into that category. Only one lived a perfect, holy, godly, and righteous life. Uh, there are none that have done that. As we read through Old Testament, New Testament scriptures, even some of the most powerful men uh, that we are supposed to look up to had character flaws. And so, I want us to think about that for a minute. God will just have to accept me the way I am. Now, we've talked the past few weeks in our Sunday morning church services about the gospel of the kingdom of God. 
And this always ends with how do we get into the kingdom of God here on earth? And it always requires changes on our part. Repentance is a change, a, a promise to live a godly life is a change. A promise to give up things that we've been doing that we know that God does not smile upon is a change. And what God is asking us to do is to conform to the way he wants us to be. In Romans chapter 9 and verse 11, Paul writes, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, because of the one who calls us, and he calls us to conform to his way of doing things. Now, unfortunately, people think that God is such a, uh, omnipresent and all-knowing and all-giving God, that even when my lifestyle um, blatantly opposes what Scripture says, we might be bold enough to say, well, you know what? Culture has changed. Our culture is not the same as it was when the words were written in our Bibles. you know what? That's just not true. The words that are written in our Bibles are there as guide, uh, guideposts, as lights, as lamps to lead our way. And they all call for us to conform, to do it the way God wants us to do it. In Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, way back when, it says, God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. God just doesn't change his mind. There is one way to get into the Lord. He's never changed that. And for us to do that, we must conform to his way of doing things. Now, in verse 4 of uh, Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 15, it says, The adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises— this, these were the people that belonged. These were Abraham's people. This is what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to adopt, adapt, adopt the, the glory and the covenants. They were supposed to accept that. That's change, and that's conformity. They couldn't go on the basis of God, take me the way I am. We're studying on our Wednesday night Zoom class about Ezekiel, and we find out that the people are in Babylonian captivity. Why? Because they took the attitude, you have to take me just the way I am. Oh, if I intermarry with uh, all of these heathen people around me, if I, if I take on their idols, you're just going to have to accept that, God. And if you don't like it, well, so what? Well, so what was that they wound up in captivity. They even lost their country because of this particular attitude. What they had to do is they had to conform, as it says in verse 8 of Romans chapter 9, to become children of the promise, not merely children of the flesh. Children of the flesh say, take me the way I am. 
children of the promise says, I want to do it your way, Lord. And so we have to conform. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, Paul writes these words. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, listen to this, to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. The only way we can get in good standing with God, the only way our identity, our image, will be the way God wants it to be in good standing with God is to do what this scripture says, to be conformed to the image of his son. There is only one way. There is only one way. Now, in Romans uh, chapter 12 uh, and verses 1 and 2, we have uh, similar uh, words written. And the Apostle Paul tells us, he says, I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy ex a sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. He says, this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to present yourself as a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable to God. What this says is you're supposed to change. How much change goes on? Well, let's read verse 2. It says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, which is good and acceptable and perfect. God says, Conform your life to my way. This is the only way that you can develop and maintain a good relationship with me is if you conform to my way of doing things. We're not in the 60s anymore, but in some ways, the 2020s are perhaps worse than the 60s. Because in the 60s, we weren't in the 24-hour news cycle. We got news at 6 and news at 11 that we look forward to here on the East Coast. We didn't get a, a news station that went on constantly. We weren't able to contact people all over the world at an instant back then the way that we can now. It, it, we live perhaps in a more turbulent era where people lay their thoughts out in front of hundreds or maybe even thousands of people to read it on, on Twitter or on Facebook or on Instagram. And sometimes after they put it out there, they're ashamed and they delete it. But unfortunately, this stuff doesn't delete This isn't being conformed to the way God wants us to be. And so finally, as I, I close the lesson, uh, our lessons on Sunday morning have all been about the gospel of the kingdom of God. And when Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, uh, Jesus explained to him that he had to be born again. Now, Jesus hadn't died yet, and so this hadn't really come into fruition yet. However, the principle was there. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he said, go preach the word to all the world, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And those that believe and are baptized they're the ones that are going to enter the kingdom of heaven. 
those that conform to the will of God. And so I offer the invitation this evening to those who have not done the will of God. You're on the outside looking in. You've conformed to your own way rather than to the way of the Lord. And I pray that if, if you study this out, you'll understand what you need to do to come in to the Lord's kingdom, his church here on earth. If you need to accept Jesus uh, this evening, if you need to take him into your life and repent of your own, your old ways, and that is giving up what you did before and conforming to what the Lord wants us to do, we offer that invitation to you. We're a phone call away in this virtual uh, media uh, presentation. Just get in touch with us and we'll be ready to help you. I pray that uh, all of you will have a, a wonderful evening. Uh, let's all just pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that uh, we have you as our God and Jesus as your Son and our Savior. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father, as we try to become more Christ-like in our lives. What it takes is change on our part. What it takes is for us to conform to the will of God and not be transformed by this world. I pray that you would bless us. I pray that you would continue to be with us. And I pray that you would help us to get into your word so that we will come to more fully understand what you would have us do with our lives to be of service to you. Bless us and uh, take care of us during the evening. Help us to make tomorrow a better day than today. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. May God bless you all and stay safe. Oh, in the power of Jesus' name.